Hi, and welcome to this week's Wu Wei Wisdom Life Lessons Teaching. It's great to be back with you all. This week, we are going to be sharing with you the three most important life lessons that you need to teach to your inner child. Now, inner child reparenting is at the absolute heart of all our Wu Wei Wisdom work, because if your inner child is out of balance and controlling your life, you cannot live in your Wu Wei flow. David will be sharing the distilled essence of working with thousands of clients on their inner child work, and you will learn the three most vital teachings to give to your inner child today. Okay, David, so before we dig into these lessons, these life lessons for our inner child, for our new supporters and listeners, do you want to give a quick recap as to what we believe the inner child is? Yes, I think this is very important, Alex, because so many people talk about the inner child and have different variation or views on what it means. For me, when I talk about the inner child, it's a description or a label that I would like to use. You could call it your subconscious mind. Some people call it their ego. Some people call it the devil that sits on the shoulder. If you want to know what it's like and what it sounds like, you could think about it as the 3 a.m. mind. You know, when you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and that little negative voice is nagging away at you, now, I would prefer to label that voice as the inner child. And as we develop this three fundamental teachings, you'll understand why the concept of thinking and speaking to it and listening to it as a child can be very powerful very powerful. And if you look back in our archive, you see, and Alex used in the, in the introduction, you can start to think about concepts such as reparenting. And so that's why I prefer to call it the inner child. And of course, this, this part of our mind or our ego was has its origin in our early childhood years in terms of what happened to us when we were younger and the experiences we had and the kind of conclusions we drew, drew about ourselves and our life. Exactly, Alex. And I think that's why I prefer that label, because in my experience, the ages of between six years old and nine years old seems to be very important, very relevant. I think this is the time when you were a child where your emotions had fully developed, but your cognitive reasoning, your thinking process was still childlike. So you came across really difficult, challenging, and dysfunctional situations, usually at home, but sometimes at school or um, the extended family or colleagues and friends, and you could not cognitively deal with it or find the solution, resolve the issue. And so you resort to the emotional, uh, very powerful emotions, and they kind of take over. Mm. So now, as adults, we have the opportunity to teach that part of our mind, our inner child, which is almost stuck uh, in the childhood years, these three vital life lessons. So, <laughs> let's Yes, so, well, that, that's why it gives you this ability, if you think about it as an inner child. When you're doing this work, think about your talking to yourself when you were six, seven, eight. Talk in that way. Listen in that way. And this this is why I like that label. It gives you that ability that you're coming in with your worldly wisdom and your knowledge and your understanding, and you're talking to that part of the mind as though you are now the spiritual parent. The part of your mind we're calling the inner child is your, very important, your spiritual child. You're the spiritual parent. This is the spiritual child that we're listening to. Wonderful. So lesson one then, David. Um, emotions. All of our teachings are about emotions and managing and understanding our emotions. So the lesson for the inner child is that you are the creator of your emotions, not the victim of them. Yes, I think for me, this is the profound life-changing difference to Wu Wei wisdom. I call it emotional education. That one teaching, you are the creator of your emotions. You are not the victim. 
Now, I am not saying you shouldn't create emotions. I am not saying emotions are wrong. I'm saying emotions make us human. They're wonderful, used appropriately. They make us very unique and connect to who we are and we can demonstrate as who we are. The problem is that for the part of the mind that we're calling the inner child, they will use emotions. You won't like this word, I don't think. They will use emotional manipulation. And if you have physical children, think about them when they don't get what they want or things aren't going right or, or they're upset or you tell them to go to bed and they're not ready. They'll do the, oh, mom, oh, yeah. They'll use their emotions to try and manipulate you, to change your mind, to take control of the situation. And the inner child part of your mind uses emotions in exactly the same way. Again, emotions aren't wrong. I'm not telling you to stop having emotions. I am telling you that you create them. And this is what I hear from, I would say, the vast majority of my clients. They say, I've heard your teachings. I agree with you, but I do not agree 100%. And I think, David, it's kind of more complicated than that, it seems to me, because not only does the inner child definitely use emotions as a form of manipulation to get your attention, to get its own way, to have a hissy fit, it also spends most of its time trying to avoid those emotions. So it uses them as a tool, a kind of a, a faulty tool, but it, it, it's like it doesn't understand emotions in the first place because it believes that when it experiences uh, emotional overwhelm, discomfort, pain, that those feelings are attacking. They're coming from external other people or external situations and attacking them. That's, that's absolutely right, Alex. And this is why then this process gets very complicated because, as you quite rightly said, the child part of your mind will use emotions to manipulate you. They will have temper tantrums, hissy fits. I like what the Chinese call it. They call it squealing piglets. And they will use that. And then there's a point that these emotions can become so powerful, and they will use words like overwhelming. They kind of fall into their own trap and so if they only have the emotions as a form of communication, they're kind of scuppered. They have nowhere to go because the emotions are causing the problem, but they can only use emotions to express the problem. And this is what I call the carousel of despair. And this is what so many of my clients find difficulty in understanding. They know it doesn't work. They know that they're using the emotions. They know they're trapped in their emotions, but they have no other way of getting out except saying, I'm overwhelmed, I'm scared, I'm frightened. And they're stuck in the emotion and they're going round and round. And then here's something else that's really important for that part of the mind. That carousel of despair becomes familiar and almost strangely comfortable. Even though you know it doesn't work, even though you know it's causing you more discomfort, more dysfunctionality, there is a draw in it because you've got to, to move out of that carousel, you've got to go down a new road, and that new road, then the inner child will create more emotions about this is scary. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to teach the inner child is that, in essence, first of all, that any emotional feelings that you're experiencing, you're creating, regardless, obviously influenced by what's going on around you, but you are you are in total control of those things. So it's not like you're a victim. So that's the headline. And then that we we can use them or the inner child or the wholeness of us and our mind can use the emotions as a positive signpost. I think this is the work I do mostly with the clients is they that confusion that you've just tried to highlight. It's very difficult and slightly different for, ev for everyone. To me, it's like a, a big ball of, you know, when all the wires of your, uh, your tech gets, gets tied up. It's like a big ball of those wires, of tech wires. And we have to unpick them and straighten them out. Because 
what happens to that mind, it almost gets caught up in its own complications. And although it will carry on using emotions, but then the emotions are causing it, 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 pro, it problems. So what we have to do is to try and get through what I call the ABC. So the A is we have a stimuli. We have something that happens to us, a person, something at work, at home. B, what do you think and what do you believe about that? What are your beliefs? What are your perceptions? How do you view that? C, the emotions. So it's A, B, C, like three steps. What a lot of my clients do, they go A, C, A, C. They miss or they don't acknowledge or take responsibility for B, what they believe, what they think. And so really that's what the golden thread, our technique of self-inquiry, is to understand that emotions are always the consequence of what you believe, your interpretation of that event. And how you change the emotion is not by sedating or eating too much, drinking too much, gambling too much. That will not change the emotion. How you change the emotion is to first understand and then take responsibility, which we'll move on to, about the thought. And so, okay, so we use those emotions because it, it often, we you know when we're busy with our day to day stuff, we're not overly analyzing or slowing down this ABC process. But the emotions um, can be used as that kind of red warning light saying, if I have strongly uncomfortable or painful emotions, I need to look more deeply at what's going on here. And as you say, that goes down to looking at our self-talk, looking at our thoughts and looking at the underlying beliefs that are connected to it. And so this takes us on to our second life lesson that we want to be teaching the inner child, which is this self-responsibility and self-accountability. Yes, so this is one of the things the inner child will duck and dive. They do not want to be accountable or take self-responsibility. They always want to move it on to somebody else. And I just explain why. Because you have to teach them that they are the creator of their beliefs, where their interpretation, their perception of what they're seeing. Now, they will not want to take accountability of that. They always will want to talk about the way they feel. And that's one of the little tips I give. Do not use the word, I feel. Do not use that word because that takes you back to your emotion. Use the, these, one of these three. I think, I believe, I choose. That's very important because that gives you accountability. There's a much more, it sounds so small, but I can tell you it's so powerful. There's a big difference between I feel anxious than I choose to be anxious. I believe I'm anxious. I think I'm anxious. And here's the difference. I feel anxious makes you the victim. In my model, I call it victim statements. You see, you're the victim of your emotion. Oh my goodness, I feel overwhelmed. I feel anxious. I feel scared. I feel frightened. I'm fearful. You see, you then become if you think about it, you're there and the emotions over you, controlling you. But how can that be when you've created the emotion? And so many of my clients will come to me and say, I need emotional protection. My life is set up to protect myself from emotions. But how can you protect yourself from something that you've created? And if you're not responsible for that creation, again, you step on the carousel. And there's a related part to this, uh, I guess, this victim mentality um, or victim mindset in that you not only do you believe the emotions are being created by external forces or other people, but that you have a wider victim story. Often the people that you're working with have a wider victim story that they don't even believe, they don't even realize is running them and keeping them in this, stuck in this inner child world. 
You're absolutely right, Alex. And you see, and this is where, where, again, for some clients, not every client, but some clients, Alex has just described, this story, the poor me story, this is another word I use with my clients, they're so good at the poor me story, they will run the poor me story. And then over the years, that story becomes their identity. And again, you're going back to what I said at the beginning. Although they know somewhere deep inside of them, this is wrong, but it's very familiar and it's very comfortable and they know how it works. It's not successful. This is what trips up a lot of my clients. There is a benefit, but it doesn't, it's not successful. And the benefit for them is it keeps them in what they consider to be the known. Changing a belief puts you into the unknown. And so there's the pressure. Do you stay with the known, even though it's unsuccessful, or do you move off into the unknown? And this is what some of my clients were saying, various ways. Better the devil you know. Better stay in this. I know it doesn't work, but if I keep on working hard enough, I can maybe improve it. But if I step off onto the unknown, David, that could be worse. Let's, let's stay with what I'm used to. And there's always a benefit for not wanting to change the belief. And that's why clients will go right to the emotion. And so also, I guess there is an element of, you know, this is not to deny that as as children, many, many people experience very uh, difficult, challenging, inappropriate situations. So in the, in that moment, they were perhaps a victim of their circumstances Absolutely. that were totally out of their control. Absolutely. But that this story becomes their whole identity rather <clears throat> than a snapshot of their life experience. And then they, it's like they give themselves that label of being a victim for the rest of their life and they expect, I guess, um, they believe <coughs> they're disabled, held back, owed some sort of uh, cosmic con compensation or that they are the the it's something is not right and they and they just keep and they hold on to that and it means that they're disempowering themselves for the rest of their life with that story and then they don't take self responsibility, full self responsibility. Absolutely right, Alex. And every client is slightly different and there's layers as you've just described, that there's layers that they've laid on top. I often think about it, you have this basic misunderstanding that we're going to move on to in a second called the vow and then on top of the vow you build like layers of an onion you build this story on top of story becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy you forget all the things that worked out right for you and you focus and it confirms all the things that doesn't go right for you and so you build up all of these and then that becomes your identity it's like wearing a pair of glasses if your glasses are tilted blue although you see the same as me but you'll see them through a blue shade and this is why beliefs are so important and being accountable for your beliefs and here's one of the reasons, this, this is so wide and so interesting when I work with my clients to help them to see their nuance of their beliefs. But let me ask you this, if you wrote down three of your top beliefs, what do I actually believe? And then ask yourself, are those actually my beliefs or have I inherited them, taken them from parents, grandparents, families, school? Do I actually believe that? That's why I always say on these, what, what is it you believe? Why do you believe it? The why is very important. And when I ask my clients that why, you know what they do? They blame somebody else. They're not taking accountability. They don't say, yes, I believe that because of this. They say, well, you know, I had to do that because my mom, I had to please my mom, I had to please my dad, I couldn't raise up, I was always criticized, and they, they won't take the ownership. And you cannot change, oh, this is so important, listen to this, you cannot change what's not yours. Own it, and then you can decide what you want to do with it. Once it's yours, as difficult as that pill is to swallow, 
then it's yours to change or to keep, to tweak, to do whatever you want with it. But owning it is so important. And that's why accountability and self-responsibility is one of the main things I work with clients. And so when you say uh, find those beliefs that are in effect running your life and reflect on them with self-responsibility. So, for example, if we dig deep and discover that we hold on to a belief that I'm a failure or um, I'm never going to be able to cope with these sorts of situations or it's important to not make a fuss and and to keep quiet. So kind of core beliefs that Mm -hmm. were given to us in childhood. We need to go back and examine those beliefs and look at the truth in them. And that is an act of self-responsibility because the not taking responsibility is embroidering those beliefs into our story and letting them dictate the whole pattern of our, our thoughts, our choices, our actions as an adult. Absolutely right, Alex. And and so I'm always trying to cut it down, to cut through this confusion. Because what we've just said there, if it's not applicable to you, you'll kind of go, crikey, that's confusing. But then when we say something that's applicable to you, you go, ah, you're talking my language, that's me. So there's so many variations. I always try and simplify it. I, I believe that's my job with my clients, to get this ball of tech wires, pull them out and simplify them. I call it, find it. That's the golden thread. What are we talking about? Find it. Own it. I can tell you, finding it sounds a lot of people the most difficult. It's not. The golden thread, you'll find it very quickly. Owning it is the most important. Owning it. It's mine. It shouldn't be mine, but it is mine. Change it. Own it. Sorry, find it. Own it. Change it. Find it. Own it. Then you can decide, or you may decide not to change it. Now it's your responsibility, and that's the key. And so this is why I think this is the second of the most important thing. Your emotions, you are the creator of your emotions. You are accountable. You cannot not be accountable. The clothes you're wearing now as you're watching me, you are accountable for putting them on this morning. If the hair, you are accountable. That's a powerful Take that accountability. Don't push it away and duck and dive and try and complicate the matters. Own it. This is what I believe. This is why I believe it. Straightforward. Clear away. And you'll be surprised how quickly this can be resolved. I say to my clients, it's like a hot knife through butter. And when we've done the work, they say it can't be that easy. It is that easy. It is that easy if you own it. Brilliant. And so moving on to the third life lesson. And I, to me, this is, I mean, the other two are vitally important in terms of the, I guess, the day to day execution and understanding of what goes on internally and how we respond to external circumstances. But this third life lesson, which is understanding and truly embracing our innate value and worth. To me, this is like the bedrock of everything because if we truly understand our innate value and worth which the inner child doesn't by and large then that provides the the motivation the spur to do the other work to do to take emotional self-responsibility to be accountable to deal with challenging situations if we truly believe and understand how amazing we are and our innate value and worth that is at at the essence it's like the power pack that charges all of this up again you're right alex and i think that what distinguishes the Wu Wei wisdom model to other models because at the heart of this is what i call shen exactly how alex has described it your innate value and worth how many videos have we done on this as you come into this world a child The midwife doesn't hold the little baby with the umbilical cord still attached to it and says, quick, can somebody give this baby some value and worth? You have innate value and worth. This cannot be added to or taken away from. This is your birthright. This is who you are. And I call that Shen. So the third one is appreciating your shen, understanding your shen, understanding your value and worth. Because so many times, 
connected to the top the first two we've talked about. Children are always looking outside of themselves, externally, to get validation, to get approval, to get strokes, to get told they're a good boy or a good girl, that their parents, their grandparents, their family are pleased with them, their culture is pleased with them. They're following the religious because they want to be pleased, they want to be liked. And all the time, what that's chipping away at in the child's mind is you have to look externally. It's like an oxygen mask. You need this oxygen to live. Unfortunately, somebody else has got their finger on the control and you have to please them to give you more oxygen. You don't understand that you have everything you need. This is your Shen spirituality. You already have it. Nobody can give you more. The Taoists say, when the cup is full, if you pour more liquid in, it just spills over. Your cup is already full. You have everything you need. Now, why doesn't the child believe this? Innately. Why doesn't he? Because he's not told this. He's told that he's lovely, and she's told that she's lovely, blah, but they're not told they have value. They're told something different in most families. They're told, the parenting techniques are told, to be a good boy, to be a good girl, you have to do what I like. The parents are trying to parent them. And what's worse than that look or that scowl from your mother or father, or maybe punishment from your mother and father, or maybe being shunned, or your brother or your sibling getting more, you believe they're getting more attention, more love, more care than you're getting. And so you see unfairness or injustice, and then the child does something that is so important that they don't even know they're doing it, Alex, but it's so vitally important that I call the vow, V-O-W, the vow. And they say to themselves, around this age we're talking about, five, six, seven, eight, nine, they say, there's something wrong with me, or there's something missing in me. And that's very important, because what you're doing there is denying mm -hmm. your innate mm -hmm. worth and your value. Yeah. You're doubting yourself. You're doubting the very core of who you are and your place in this universe. And then from that vow, you start to build up the layers of the onion. And of course, I think many, many people listening to this teaching will recognize that that system of parenting or upbringing they experienced in their early years because we naturally look to our parents or our carers or our grandparents or our teachers for, I guess, feedback. Are we doing something right? Are we doing something wrong? And that puts in place this system of looking externally for validation. And if we do the slightest thing wrong, as you say, it's hugely common and hugely destructive that we create this vow like questioning ourselves questioning our own worth questioning our own abilities but the critical thing here is that we take this from childhood into adulthood all these learnings and all these beliefs and this core vow it's carried through from our childhood years into adulthood Exactly. So that core vow, there's something missing, there's something wrong with me. Then the next layer is the three lies. I'm not good enough. I can't cope. I'm unlovable. If you've ever said that to yourself, don't tell anybody else, but as you listen to me, if you've said that to yourself, you have a vow. This vow is very important. In Taoism, it's called the fountainhead. I sometimes call it the first domino. Do you know when you hit the domino and all the dominoes spread out? You have to get to that first domino because that vow is what's sending you on the wrong road. And so what you do then, as we've said before, those, I'm not good enough, I can't cope, those then become the pattern of thinking and then they become the identity. And as you said, Alex, that becomes the identity. You view the world, the, the tinting your glass that your perception of the world is right through your life. Even though and many of my clients are highly successful in different fields, but they've got this internal dialogue going on in their mind that I call the inner child. 
believing they're a fraud, imposter syndrome, they're not good enough, doubting themselves, it's all going to go wrong, uh, uh, it's somebody doing more than me, I'm not perfect, I can't fail. See, all these are subtleness, such as CCJ, criticizing, comparing, being judgmental, all the things we talk about in the videos. So they do not want to be CCJ, yet they will CCJ everybody, including themselves, never happy, never satisfied, never being able to jump over the bar. Again, we've done so many videos and all of these kind of nuances, but it comes if you trace it down to the vow. And even this is something else a lot of my clients do. They confuse their innate value, their Shen, with society's value. Society's value is different to your Shen, but society value will change all of the time. Uh, society for how thin should you be? How fat should you be? What color? Yeah, well, this, that, you know, is this all right? Society's value is always changing. But what they do, they value society's value, but they don't value their own value, and then adds to the confusion. And I think, moreover, David, the, the teaching our inner child that no matter what uh, experiences we have in our life, what, no matter what setbacks, no matter what traumas we have in our life, this, those do not diminish our share. Those do not diminish our innate value and Cannot. worth. It, it's, it, this is something that is so intrinsic to the essential vitality of who we are. Yes, we can learn new skills. Yes, we can climb the career ladder. Yes, we can accumulate wealth. Yes, we can have health or wealth setbacks, but it does not diminish or change in any way the purity of this Shen essence of who we are. Yes, and that's why I think this is the most important teaching, Shen. This innate value and worth. Do you doubt yourself? And this is only questions that you can ask and answer for yourself in your own mind. Have you got that seed of doubt that there's something missing in you? You could be better. You should be more. You're not enough. You can't cope with some things. You're unworthy. You're unlovable. People uh, um, are, are seeing through the mask. And if you've got that, this is the vow. And here's the life lesson. And this is why, again... I like to do this inner child work. If you want to test this for yourself after this, li listening to this teaching, use the Shen test. What you say to yourself, imagine you've got your own child or a niece or a nephew, and they're about six or seven, and they come to you and they say, auntie or mom, dad, um, I, I only got six out of 10 on my maths exam today at school. Would you say to them, well, that's because you're not good enough? You'd, be, you'd laugh. My clients laugh when I say that. Yeah. Would you, if, if, a, if a niece or nephew comes to you and says, my mum and dad don't love me, would you say to them, well, that's your fault. That's because you're unlovable. You laugh, but you say that to yourself. And this is why... I love to use this idea that you now watching this teaching and listening to this teaching, you are the spiritual parent. This part of your mind is your spiritual child. It is your accountability, responsibility to teach the child. So the first thing that you have to do as a parent is to learn it yourself. Don't just mimic what you come down through your family trees Take a responsibility. Make sure what you're saying to yourself is what you would say to that physical child. If that physical child comes to you and says, my daddy doesn't love me, you wouldn't say to that child, well, that's, because that's your fault. That's because you've got no worth and value and you're unlovable. Look at you. No wonder he doesn't love you. What would you say to that child? And I can tell you what a lot of my clients say. I don't know. And I say, well, you better learn because you've got that child inside of you all of the time. And this is what Wu Wei Wisdom is about. It's about finding the nuance. We've done very general, broad brush picture of the three foundationals. Your emotion education. You are the creator of your emotions. Your 
accountability and self-responsibility and your shame. So this is your job as the parent. Learn that. Make it resonate with you. That's right and true and honest and has integrity for you. Honor your shame. And then you can become the teacher to your inner child. Because now you have to build up that relationship that the inner child will trust you. As Alex said, you are amazing. Amazing. There is no one in the cosmos like you. You are unique. Honor and respect yourself. Do this because you're worth it. Not because somebody else tells you. Do it for you. And this is the way out of this carousel of despair. This is the way to step off the carousel and start living to your true, honest potential. Wonderful. Thank you, David. And I will put links in the show notes so you can learn more about the inner child reparenting, more about emotional self-responsibility, and also more about Shen, your innate value and worth. I really do hope you enjoyed this teaching. Do comment and let us know and perhaps share the teaching with someone else who you think may also benefit. David works every week with clients all over the world on these sort of issues and inner child reparenting. If you'd like to learn more about David's one-to-one consultations via Zoom, I will also put a link to learn more about those in the show notes as well. And finally, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We produce new teachings every week and we would love to share your journey with you. Bye-bye.